and Colossians 1. Colossians chapter 1, please. These words written by the Apostle Paul. Verse 12, we'll begin to read. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12, where Paul says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or power, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And there's a verse in chapter 2 and uh, verse 9, chapter 2, verse 9, it says, For in him that's in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Now that's all I just want to read with the Lord's blessing. I really want to gather the thoughts tonight, especially around verse number 14. It's not a very long verse, but there is a lot in it. And there are four things that I just want to try and underscore in this great verse, where Paul speaks about the Lord Jesus, and he says, in whom? What a, what a beginning that is. He says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. I want you to think about the center, in whom, that Christ is the center. And then he says, we have redemption. And that is the certain something that we have. He says we have redemption through his blood. That's the cost. And then he says, even the forgiveness of sins. And that's the cancellation. So that's very simple, isn't it? You know, Paul was writing these words to a church. And of course, when I say a church, I'm referring to a company, a number of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ that made up that church 
which was in the city of Colossae. And he is writing to emphasize and to show them and to tell them how great Christ is. Now, the reason why he was doing that is because there was a false teaching that was knocking on the door, as it were, of that church. And part of the false teaching was this, that there were other persons, angels, that were just as great as Christ. In fact, they were teaching the worshipping of angels. And Paul writes to tell these people and show these Christians that there is only one who can be worshipped, that Christ exceeds and excels all others. And no matter how great the angel may be, they are but secondary to Christ. Now I'll tell you something. That problem still happens in the world today. Because there are still many peoples in the world who are worshipping all types of God and what they term as deities. The Bible says, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. That the Lord Jesus Christ is far above everything and everyone, no matter who they are, that he is all in all. And so Paul says, in whom Christ is the center. It's very simple tonight. You, you know, if you take the illustration, if you, if you take a bicycle wheel, now I know you don't see as many people on bicycles as you maybe used to be. Uh, sometimes if you're riding a bicycle if you were riding a bicycle on the roads these days you, you might be afraid of getting knocked over well we all know what a bicycle wheel is and in a bicycle wheel there is the hub that's the center. And then the spokes go out from the hub to the rim of the wheel. So you've got the hub and then you've got the spokes that go out to the rim. Now that's it tonight. Christ is the hub. And Every spiritual and every eternal blessing comes from him and reaches out like the bicycle wheel which is round the world in which we live, that it reaches round the globe wherever men are found that through Christ they can experience the blessing of forgiveness, of peace with God, pardon from sin. Oh, I'll tell you something. 
He is the hope. He is the scent. And you know, if you or I are going to experience the blessing, we need to get to the hub. We need to get to Christ because it's only from him that these great blessings, they come. Now, there's much tonight we could say on this, but let, let me mention this. You see, Christ is the center. And these verses that we have read, they would teach us that as to creation, he is the source. Well, Paul tells us here that for by him were all things created, whether things in heaven or earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or, or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things. Now wait. Don't expect me to try and go into all that tonight. Because I'll tell you this. There, there are waters to swim in. There's a vast. But I'll tell you this. As to creation, he is the source. Now, I know that West Cork here and um, the scenery around these parts is beautiful. But I want to let you in a little secret. You haven't seen it all until you get to the north of Ireland. <laughs> Well, you know, there's a place called Newcastle, County Down. And there is a forest called Tullymore Forest Park. <laughs> right at the foot of the Mourne Mountain. It is a beautiful park. It was once owned by a man called Lord Roden. In the 1800s, who was a very devout believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that great grounds was left to the people to enjoy. But in the forest, with all its walkways and such like, and the river and all of that, there is what we call the big stone at Tullymore, Forest Park. It's still there. And on this big stone, Lord Roden got the words engraved. And it simply says this, stop, look around, and praise the name of him who made it all. And then there is a reference to John's gospel, chapter 1, and verse 2 or 3, that all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was me. As to creation, he is the source. As to the church, he is the head. That's what it said. He is the head over all things to the church. You say, what church? There's a whole lot of church. Well, the church that Paul is referring to here is not a building 
of stones and uh, mortar and all the great buildings that there are. He's not speaking about that. But when he says that the Lord Jesus, he is head over all things to the church, that he's speaking of men and women who are in the church, the church of Christ, which is his body, not made of stones and bricks and mortars, but people who are living, who have been saved by the grace of God, redeemed with the blood of Christ, and they're in the church. Now, when I was a boy of 11, I became, are you listening? I became a member of that church. The Church of Christ. The night that I got saved. And you know something? On the very same night, my older brother, he got saved as well. And the Bible says that the Lord He's adding to the church daily such as should be saved. What does that mean? It means this tonight. If you got saved in this meeting, you would be part of that church. Now the question is this tonight. Are you part of that church? You see, this church, which is made up of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, it straddles every continent. And people from all over the world who have personally received Christ as Savior, and they're part of it. But you know, the amazing thing is this. It's like a stone in the building. If you could get the illustration that when a person gets saved, they become, as it were, a living stone, and in a sense, they're built into that church. Well, I want to tell you tonight, that church is near completion. To use a term that we all would be familiar with, we're nearly at the top of the spire. And the church is nearly complete. But are you in it? Now, I'm not here about asking people what church they go to here. I'm concerned about, are you in this church? The church of Christ. The church where every stone in that building has received life from Christ who is the chief cornerstone. So, as to creation, he is the source. As to the church, he is the head. As to the Christian, he is their sufficiency. Paul says, ye are complete in him. But let me come very quickly. He says, in whom? There's the center. That's the hope. Right. 
He says, we have redemption. That's the certain. Something that is certain. Now you have heard the phrase, I'm sure, at times that people use as regards this world. You've heard people say that there's nothing certain but uncertain. And do you know what that means? Yeah, we do. Well, I want to tell you tonight. Here is something that is certain. Here is something tonight that you can have. Paul says, in whom we have redemption. You say, what is that word redemption? Well, in the Bible, from Genesis Right through to the book of the Revelation, there's a red line. And that red line is the line of redemption. Is the line that tells us about blood that was shed to redeem. What, what is it tonight? To be redeemed. Well, you see, for a person to redeem something, they have to pay a price for it. It's, it's the thought of being delivered from by the payment by a price that's paid. You know, the Bible tells us this tonight. That you and I, because of sin, we are in the kingdom of darkness. And Paul in these words says, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness to be redeemed from the domain and the dominion of sin and Satan by the payment of a price. And that price was paid by the Lord Jesus on the cross. He says, we have redemption. That it's the thought that I'm free that I have been delivered. That I'm no more in bondage or in fetters or in fears. But I have been delivered from that. Because someone has paid the price for me. And the Lord Jesus paid that price on the cross. You know... Way back in the days of slavery, as you know, it was a vile trade. But way back in the early 1800s in America, especially in the southern states, slavery was a terrible thing. And slaves were sold at auctions just like cattle. They were brought along in chains. They'd been brought from the west coast of Africa and across the Atlantic and arriving in America and they were sold asleep. In a certain town in the southern states of America, one day there was an auction of slaves. And there was a visitor in the town. And he went along to 
this auction where they were selling the slaves just like animals, all chained. One by one, they were brought forward to be sold. <coughs> and this man, this visitor, as, as he watched and witnessed this, he was horrified. Are these poor souls from, from, from Africa who were just being sold like cattle? And as they were brought one by one and sold, the price, the hammer fell. Another price, the hammer fell. There was a woman, slave, who was, who was led forward. And she seemed somewhat weak. <coughs> and they started to bid. But this stranger started as well. And the price went higher. And he went higher still. And he got these terrible dagger looks. You know. Who is this? Who's this boy? And the price went on. And the stranger. He went on. And the price went higher and he went higher still until the hammer fell. And the auctioneer said, the slave is yours. Do you know what that man did? He stepped forward to that slave and with a raised voice, he said to her, he said, I have paid the highest price for you today to set you free forever. He bought the slave to free I want to tell you tonight that the Lord Jesus on the cross of Calvary, he paid the highest price. He could do no more. He could pay no more. And he paid the highest price to set you and I free forever. That's what it is. To be redeemed for the chains, as it were, to be broken and to be brought in to the liberty and the light of the gospel of Christ. Oh, to me, can you see that? He has paid the price. I couldn't pay it. You couldn't pay it. But he paid it for me. We sometimes sing. I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. And Paul says, we have redemption. It's certain. Well, I, I want you to know, dear friend, tonight in this meeting, that you can be absolutely sure that you'll be in heaven, that you can know, that you can have. We have. Not that we're keeping our fingers crossed. Not that we're hoping. Not that we're wishing. But we have. 
do you have a It's a good thing to know where you're going to do that. Albert Einstein. I was just reading that uh, a letter that he signed all those years ago is to be sold soon. And because he signed this letter in relation to the whole subject of atomic warfare and such like, it's worth millions. Albert Einstein, as most of you know, was one of the greatest scientists. A man of great knowledge. World renowned. But when Albert Einstein came towards the end of life, do you know what he said? He said this. He said, I know who I am. but I don't know where I'm going. He says, I know who I am, but I don't know where I'm going, friend. That is probably, he was probably the most intelligent man of a generation or more. I asked you tonight, do you know where you're going? The poet said, the train goes down the track. There ain't no turning back when you reach the other side and eternity begins. Which station will your train be in? Heaven or hell? Do you know where you're going? Well, listen, guys. This book is absolutely clear that you can know where you're going. I'm sure of heaven tonight. than I am of getting home. You know? In whom, sent we have redemption, the certain. Through his blood, the call. Even the forgiveness of sins, the counsel. I want to tell you this tonight as I close. It's a great thing to have the sleep white clean. It's a great thing when, as it were, reverently speaking. When God pushes the delete button, my sons are gone. No religion can do it. No works on my part can do it. No payment on my. <coughs> but Christ paid it all for me. And the Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son. Cleanses us from all things. I'll tell you this and I'm finished. Harry Ironside was a great preacher in America in a bike one day. I think he died about 1951. <laughs> he preached to great crowds of people. And one Afternoon, he had preached to quite an audience. 
And during the meeting, its introduction, and during his message, he, he quoted the words, there is a fountain filled with blood. We sang it tonight. Drawn from Emmanuel. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty state. When the meeting was over and the people were leaving, there was a very elegant, well dressed lady walked up to Dr. Ironside and she stared him in the face and she said, Dr. Ironside, you don't really believe the words of that old hymn. There's a fountain filled with blood. And he sort of took his breath for a minute. And he said to this woman, he said, well then, he said, uh, what are you going to fill it up with then? Are you going to fill it up with your good deeds, your church attendance, your charity giving? I mean, go over a whole list. And then he said to the woman, he said, he said, I do believe the old man. There is a fountain filled with blood. Drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood and all oh, their guilty stains. Friend tonight, what are you going to fill it up with? There only is one remedy. Christ, his death, his cross, his glorious resurrection, he alone can set you free. He alone can bring you from bondage to freedom, from darkness to light. Shall we pray? Lord, we just ask thee as we part that these things may grip our hearts to me. We just long that someone might see the necessity of this. And may grasp the simplicity of it. And to see that Christ is all. That he paid all and he did all on the cross. That they might be saved. Oh, for a heart to respond. We ask it as we part in thy name. Amen.